Greetings and welcome to week nine. Uh, I hope uh, so far this week uh, you've uh, had a chance to look at what we're going over. Um, I, of course, am going to cover uh, most of it in this lecture, and uh, I would hope that you you read after you listen to the lecture. That way, that you get more of an understanding. So let's. Uh, start our little discussion here about uh, chapter 10. Uh, the title of the chapter is Establishing a Code of Ethics and Ethical Guidelines. The uh, purpose of this chapter is to help you understand the importance of having a code of ethics, as well as to give you some examples on how firms uh, can establish or revise their existing code of ethics. Uh, it's going to highlight the linkages between a code of ethics and uh, the various stakeholders. And it's important. It's an important uh, integration necessary uh, for the uh, firm, business, what, whatever term you would like to use for it, uh, to fulfill the needs and expectations uh, necessary for it to fulfill the needs and expectations of the stakeholders. Uh, by understanding the benefits of a good comprehensive code of ethics, uh, firms are uh, able to capture positive goodwill as well as potentially enhance their uh, competitive uh, advantage. Uh, the chapter presents uh, you with some uh, examples of good code of ethics and explains why they uh, move, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, their companies to the forefront by linking their ethical uh, philosophy with the needs of the stakeholders. Uh, the chapter also demonstrates uh, uh, how one stakeholder, the government, uh, can significantly influence the content of code of ethics and we know the government they make regulations constantly uh, some things are over regulated some things are not regulated enough um, just my personal thought um, it uh, will conclude with some examples uh, that you should read and uh, become aware of okay um, What's the role of a code of ethics? Uh, one answer could be the social, social values of society. The social norms uh, will always drive what's considered acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Uh, whether it's new government regulations or uh, a shift in uh, consumers' tastes, uh, change in social values uh, are going to always bring uh, significant change in, in ethical standards. Uh, if you look on uh, page 181, figure 10-1, um, of the three factors within the shaded box, the institutional and organizational factors would be least likely to change since they've become firmly entrenched in the firm's value system. As a result, the personal factors would probably have the highest probability uh, to change over time, which would uh, also re result in a change in the ethical standards of the firm. Well, what about the code of ethics and stakeholders? Now, the use of the four values of integrity, justice, uh, competence, and utility help explain how firms integrate meeting the needs and expectations of stakeholders uh, with ethical strategic focus. Now, uh, there are a lot of questions that we might ask ourselves, you know, one being uh, whether each 
of those four values needs to be equal uh, from a stakeholder perspective. Uh, now it could be argued that uh, utility is the most important since uh, it's this value which addresses uh, specific needs of the stakeholders. Another one you might ask yourself is whether stakeholders are truly concerned about the ethical strategic focus of the firm. Do they really care? Uh, now, as with uh, other issues related to stakeholder interactions, uh, it could be assumed that stakeholders would constantly monitor the ethical strategic focus of the firm unless there's been information released about potential unethical activities and or uh, whether or not the firm is performing poorly and not been able to satisfy the needs of the stakeholders from a financial or goal perspective. Um, there are some benefits to having a code of ethics uh, and they're usually stakeholder driven. Uh, having a comprehensive code of ethics helps create a positive work environment which makes the employees highly motivated. Uh, it also increases the uh, potential competitive advantage of the firm which makes the customers happy. Happy customers, happy employees, happy business. Um, with stakeholders being satisfied, uh, it makes the managers happy. And then we all know if our managers are happy, they're not uh, in a derogatory mode uh, all the time, which makes us happy. Um, the net result is that the uh, benefits of having a comprehensive code of ethics make it an easy decision whether uh, the firm should have a code or not. Um, the benefits would outweigh any time and financial costs involved in, in implementing uh, a comprehensive ethical strategic vision. Uh, yes, it costs to, uh, uh, to go through the meetings and, and uh, research and uh, the uh, impl uh, implementing uh, and then adapting but all of that could be outweighed by all the good that it gives you. Um, the role of total responsibility management uh, and the code of ethics. Total responsibility management or what we call TRM is uh, a useful tool uh, to use to understand how ethics management is a continuous process. Uh, just like uh, TQM looks for ways to continuously improve the performance of the firm. TRM serves the same purpose from the ethical management perspective. Uh, you need to realize that ethics management requires continuous investment of time and resources by the firm so that the firm's ethical vision can evolve with the changing perceptions of stakeholders. Now, when talking about uh, TRM, it might be useful for you to draw out like a three-step model. Uh, inspiration and then do an arrow to integration, do an arrow to innovation. So the inspiration process, the integration process, and the innovation process. So the inspiration process is the first and the most critical step in the model. Um, it is so because the decision made at this step drives the other two steps. 
it's uh, the responsibility of the top level managers to not only embrace their ethical vision, but to consider ideas that are not usually within the norm of the decision making process. That's why this step is called the inspiration process. It's in this step that the manager should uh, be allowed to step outside the box uh, in not uh, only what their ethical vision should be, but also how it should be formulated and implemented. And it's also important to note that stakeholders are integrated into the decision-making process at the inspiration process stage. Now again, during this stage that creative ideas, it's during this stage that the creative ideas uh, are encouraged uh, helping satisfy the needs and the expectations of the firm's various stakeholders. The integration process addresses ethical strategic formulation and the implementation stage of the process. So it's through the integration process that the ethical visions of the top managers are transferred into uh, viable courses of action. Uh, by determining the strategic focus human resource capabilities and current management systems, the uh, firm can uh, excuse me, adjust uh, the vision to fit that uh, strategic capabilities of the firm. The innovation stage examines how well the strategic vision has been implemented and looks to see where uh, improvements can be made when the inspiration process starts over again. Uh, steps for code ethics, code of ethics. Uh, the underlying theme from each uh, method is that met the, the method must align with the ethical beliefs of the top level uh, managers. Uh, it's from this alignment that the steps are created in order to uh, develop the effective uh, code of ethics. Each code of ethics should be specialized and uh, customized to the specific needs of the firm and the needs of the stakeholders of the firm. Um, The uh, listing of reasons why uh, a code of ethics should be adapted, talking about the value now, uh, developed by Bondi, Matten, and Moon. <clears throat> the uh, highlight, uh, excuse me, highlight both the external and internal reasons uh, why it's beneficial for the firm to adopt a code of ethics. Again, the specific jurors. Uh, uh, specific justification uh, for each firm depends on that ethical vision and the beliefs of the firm's top level managers. Uh, in, uh, in enlightened firms continue to adjust their code of ethics to generate positive benefits for their stockholders, employees, and other stakeholders. In addition, uh, the same firms understand how strong positive uh, ethical uh, image can be uh, enhanced uh, by their competitive advantage. Um, let me turn this line on. I think I just cut off my computer here. Maybe not. Yep. Things happen, even to uh, educators. <laughs> so, uh, continuing on. Um, examples of codes of ethics. Uh, uh, By giving specific guidance uh, in what should be considered in a code of ethics, uh, 
helps uh, realize that a code of ethics may incorporate a number of different areas uh, in which uh, they may not have uh, realized uh, there could be potentially unethical activity from the firm's employees. Uh, the examples of codes of ethics, uh, especially in your book, uh, show how the specific content of the code reinforce the ethical vision of the firm. Uh, the code of ethics is written, is uh, a written representation of the ethical commitment the firm has for its various stakeholders. The uh, comparison of the value statements uh, given in the table 10.2 highlight just subtle differences in the firm's code of ethics. Now, although there's uh, an overlap in certain concepts in the two value statements in 10.2, the differences should be stressed because it's these differences that separate the firms from each other as they are evaluated on the ethical commitment of their stakeholders. One of the stakeholders, as we all know and love, the government. So what's their role? So the role of government regulations uh, is critical in any development of a firm code of ethics. The government plays an active role. It's helping shape and determine what should be included in the code of ethics, as we discussed. The government is constantly creating rules and regulations. Uh, those rules and regulations can dictate, in part, uh, what should be included in the code of ethics, along with the level of detail in describing the firm's ethical commitment in certain areas. For example, uh, let's take, uh, excuse me, bribery. Bribery is illegal for uh, U.S. state-based uh, firms, but the firm has to determine when a genuine gift ends and a bribe begins. Uh, is taking a client out to dinner a bribe? How about giving a client a watch with the firm's logo on it? Uh, there are lots of examples out there. Uh, I mean, I, I, in a case like that, I, I don't know. To me, giving a client a watch with the firm's logo on it would be advertisement. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of gray areas. It's not always black and white. It's usually in, in a gray area, and you have to, to really uh, uh, think about it. Um, Let's talk about, uh, lastly, uh, global code of ethics. So if you look on your uh, page 194, uh, the global code of ethics helps you understand the ethical issues, or that ethical issues are global issues, and how they are uh, resolved can vary based on where the ethical issues take place. Uh, for instance, a comparison of the CRT and OECD and UN Code of Ethics highlights that NRO put a significant level of emphasis on how firms conduct business around the world. Uh, this set of global Code of Ethics demonstrates that uh, NGOs are certainly stakeholders which firms need to consider when they're developing and implementing their uh, ethical vision. Um, the Global Code of Ethics also shows us that uh, in the United States it would be considered uh, simple human rights are not necessarily so in other countries. I mean, you know, what uh, we consider human rights in uh, some countries in Africa, in uh, the uh, uh, Mediterranean, uh, you know, wherever, wherever it not always the same as what we think, although we usually think that uh, what we think is correct, but you know. <clears throat> uh, 
So as a result of that, uh, it's important to stress uh, to you that uh, human rights are not protected in other parts of the world. And there is a large disconnect between how employees are treated in developed world versus how they're treated in developing world. Uh, for instance, sweatshops. Uh, there are places in uh, uh, the world where people practically live at work. Um, they don't get days off. Children are worked and work as hard, if not harder, than adults. Um, so, you know, in our country that wouldn't, wouldn't fly because basic human rights. Well, in those countries, they don't have the rights. So, uh, it gives us a lot to think about. <clears throat> uh, I hope this gives you an uh, insight into uh, this week. I look forward to reading your discussion uh, questions and, uh, excuse me, discussion replies. <clears throat> uh, if you need me, I'm available by email or cell. Uh, you know how to contact me. Please contact me. Do not forget to uh, do your postings. Uh, so, you know, there are consequences to what we don't do as well as what we do do occasionally. Uh, have a great week, and uh, as I said, if you need me, contact me. Thank you.